Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to a virtual version of Wilderness Wildlife Week. And uh, we're in the 30th year of this presentation. But today, we can't be with you, but we're going to connect with you. And uh, we're going to have a great time this morning. I'm so happy that uh, you're tuned in. Uh, I know we're all waking up here in the Smokies. Uh, we're, we're falling out and waking up. Uh, it's a cold morning below uh, freezing temperatures, snowed all night, still snowing this morning. It's absolutely beautiful in the mountains. And we're going to take you there, um, maybe not literally, but virtually this morning. And uh, I want to share with you a program um, that's the uh, first time I've ever shared this, but uh, very important to me and, and one that I think you'll enjoy. We're going to do everything from uh, spend time with the bears to... Uh, talk about other wildlife species here, but we're going to talk about what it's like in the winter in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and why it's so important to uh, to enjoy our winter season. A lot of people, it's the least visited season of the year in the Smokies, and yet it can be the most uh, wonderful, the most wondrous, I'll say. So let's talk about that a little bit. I'm Ken Jenkins, and uh, I love Wilderness Wildlife Week. I've been here since the the get go, as we say here in the mountains, and we've had a great run and just uh, met some wonderful people. And, and our goal and our desire is that next year we'll all be in one big room and uh, we'll be shaking hands and, and laughing and, and sharing stories and experiences and, and just having the great time that we've had for 30 years now. So please plan to, uh, to join us next year and we'll look forward to that. The title of my program this morning, um, if we need a title, would be uh, that the mountains tremble, we're still looking up. Now, I, I don't need to remind you that uh, not only are the mountains trembling, but our whole world is trembling right now. Uh, we are in a, a situation that I've, uh, I've interpreted to some folks as an interruption in life. You know, we all have a lot of interruptions in life. Some, some of those interruptions are uh, are, are constant because uh, we just have things that we um, that become part of our life, things that just constantly change. So not only is our world changing and our life is changing, but the mountains are changing. So we're going to build a frame of of how how things change, and, and we're going to talk about trembling. And you're going to see the literal mean that word as we start the program this morning. The mountains tremble. And the second part of that title is, but we're still looking up. This is probably the most positive uh, event that I've ever been connected with in the sense of a, a, a secular, a free event that pours out to people and it gives and gives and gives. The City of Prince and Forbes has, has underwritten this program so that you and I can enjoy things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. We have transportation and speakers and uh, renowned speakers from all over the country that come here to uh, give it their best uh, so that you and I can benefit from that. So uh, we're looking up. Uh, we're, we're looking up in every sense of the world. This is a, this mountain home of ours is a, a place of, of great people, of, uh, people of patriotic people, people of great faith, godly people, uh, sound and, and giving and open hearted people. So you're going to have a good time this morning. We're just going to laugh a little bit. Uh, I have some notes, but I don't know that I'll go with those. We're just going to talk about the beauty of this area. So let's just start start moving a little bit. If I can get my clicker to change. A little delay. The other thing about wilderness work is we don't strive for perfection. We, we strive for not for performance, but for pleasure. We want you to have a good time. And in the process, we should have a good time because when we work in the technology, it doesn't always work with us. So if there's delays or if I say something just totally unrelated to what we're talking about, just chuckle and realize we're just real people. Uh, trying to connect with you uh, to have a really good time. But when I talk about those uh, mountains changing, I want to tell you how literal that is. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't change. I mean, uh, uh, 
we we have things in our bucket list that we want to never get around to. Uh, we have things in our, our life that uh, we may not uh, fulfill. We may um, we may never keep up with the Joneses. We may never live to be a hundred. But there's certain things that we will be able to do. But I want to tell you about how these mountains tremble this morning. In in 2016, Dr. Andrew Johnson did a study on the geology of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And this mountain that you see in the distance is called Mount Lacant. Many of you have climbed this mountain. I've spent countless nights on there. I used to work for a fellow that built the old lodge on top of the mountain. And, and I hiked up there quite often and still love to go. But do you know that Mount Lacant is a dormant volcano? Talk about the mountains tremble. It literally is a dormant volcano he described as it being at rest. So in that sense, we have minor tremors around the area. And sometimes uh, these minor tremors are more than minor. There's a thrust fault that goes through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And that just simply means there's a break in the surface of the earth. And, and quite often we have earthquakes, mostly the magnitude around 2.5 or 3.0. And, and, and those cause minor tremors, but mostly they go unnoticed. But not all of them, just 60 miles away from the eastern border of the Smokies in North Carolina, we had a, a, an earthquake of 5.1 magnitude, which is really a, a, a tremble. More than a tremble, it's a rumble. So these mountains are, are changing and trembling, but you know what? That's part of the wonder. Change is part of the wonder in these mountains. So many things have changed the mountains in my lifetime and continue continually change the mountains. We have uh, we have snow today, and when that snow melts, we we'll have roaring streams. We we'll have miles and miles of streams in these mountains, over 2,000 miles of streams, mostly spring-fed from the top of the mountain. And these springs are clear, so it's pure water, and it comes out of the ground because it's, it's from, uh, it comes across what we call insoluble uh, sandstone. In other words, that, that doesn't melt down or break down, so when this water comes out of the ground, it's good, pure water to drink out of the spring. Not so much when it starts down here because the animals and, and bacteria from other plants and things enter the water, and so we don't drink the water until we purify. So I don't want to encourage that. But change is part of the wonder of these mountains. We live in an area rich with wildlife, uh, abundant wildlife. This is a gray fox pair. Uh, the great thing about the gray fox is he can climb a tree, so he stays clear of his predator with the coyote. Uh, so he, he tends to thrive here more than the red fox. We'll talk about that shortly. But the, the fox is a, a wonderful part of that. Uh, of the uh, fauna here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This is a habitat for a, a great variety of, of animals, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. A gray fox has one to seven little kits, so those little guys uh, grow up fast and learn all the traits of the adult animal, and they do well. You know, one of the things that people enjoy most, and I know I do, uh, it's the quietness of winter. And Smokies. We call it, uh, sometimes we, we, we uh, define quiet as, as a state of solitude. And, and when you look up the word solitude, it, it means undisturbed. It means peaceful and, and uh, secluded. And, and, and it's, solitude is something that we seek out. We're always looking to, uh, to find that, that quiet time. And in these 550,000 acres of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we can find lots of solitude. And that's one of the things we do at Williams Wildlife Group. We take you out into the mountains. And, and at intervals, we just sort of sit down and listen. The, the streams are, are muffled under uh, large amounts of snow this morning. And it can be just a, a, a beautiful time to be out. Snowflakes are still falling. But wintertime is, is extra special. So when we sat down and planned uh, Wilderness Wildlife Week from the beginning, we thought, gosh, what a great time for people to come and enjoy a, a very uh, uh, good experience with, with fewer people. Uh, not that we don't love people. We love people who come here year round. We thrive on that. But we also love our quiet time, and we think you will too. So 
winter solitude. You know, every morning from the top of these mountains, we get these uh, beautiful, unusual sunrises. Uh, sunrises is, we sort of take that for granted. We stand up there on the mountains, we look at all that. We call it, that's how the mountains got their name, the Great Smoky Mountains. All these vapors from millions of plants and uh, trees, shrubs, uh, those things give off vapor. And that vapor turns into a fog. And when the sun comes up in the morning and it goes down in the evening, you may know this, but there's long, those long rays of light produce red, orange, and yellow. Short rays of light produce blue. So the sky gets blue as the sun comes up. But in the mornings and in the evenings, when the sun is near the horizon, you get these long rays of light that strike the vapor and turn it to all these warm, beautiful colors. So every day, every morning is new and every morning is different. This landmark is iconic of the Smokies. This is the Chinese area of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, if you're familiar with the area, and if you've hiked here, or, or if you've never visited here, you may have heard that uh, we had a tremendous fire back in 2016. Um, and and it, it actually scattered these mountains and it became so hot that part, we had landslides on the mountain. And this area uh, is forever changed since we're talking about change in these mountains. This morning, uh, if we went up to the chimneys when the sun starts to come out this afternoon and the snow stops falling, it's a tongue twister, we would, uh, would see this, the chimneys more like this photograph because the chimneys are in a state of rest and yet by March and April, even though you'll see the, the, the trees that have been burned, uh, you'll also see at the lower part of this photograph the rhododendron is starting to bloom. This is a barometer. Uh, I call it of, of the great blooms and smokies, and we have many of those we'll talk about in just a minute. But places uh, like in that, that first image you saw uh, of, of the chimneys, it's like a lava flow. This is Catawba rated dendron uh, that grows here in the smokies, and it's quite a beautiful sight to enjoy. Well, of all the things that people want to see when they come to the smokies, are certainly black bears, and we're in a, a two year. Um, Growth period, I call it a bumper crop. We have had more uh, bears and bear cubs in the last two years than I've experienced in all my life. And, and bears are, are my favorite subject. I've written about bears and photographed bears for many years. These two yearling bears, which they say are the mother, were born about right now in the den. And they're just tiny little. Uh, little balls of fur, the eyes closed, snuggled up next to the mother bear. She can have uh, one, two, three, or four. And they grow through the year and mimic the, the teachings of the mother bear. And then in the fall, they bring up the second winter with the mother bear, and they come out in the spring, and she says, okay, you're on your own. After a period of time, usually about May or June. And these two yearlings are uh, decided they'll just be buddies for a while, so they're just sort of staying together. I photographed these this past uh, summer in June, and they were just playing, having a real good time. Another bear is an incredible animal. I've been studied here, Dr. Michael Patton studied the black bear here for 20 uh, something years, and did incredible research, and I used to go with him on occasion. And, but the, the mother bear is, is extra special in, in the way that she not only cares for and protects her cubs, but the way she um, uh, just knows everything that they need to know about about the bear. We're doing, I told you we're going to do some adjustments here as we go, so we're just uh, just going to have a great time, and everything's going to work out just fine. Am I all set? Thank you. This mother bear, just to give you a for instance, of how sensitive they are to the cubs and how connected they are to those little cubs. She had three cubs, but when it was time for her to rest, and the mother bear no dress when she has three cubs. Your moms can connect to that, but she would go to sleep, but she put those little cubs up in the tree behind her. You can see a little bit of that trunk of that tree. But what you can't see is that when those cubs are up in that tree and they go to sleep, she puts her foot in the trunk of that tree 
so that she can feel any vibration, any change, or any disturbance in her pads, and she'll react to that immediately. Which is why we always caution you to enjoy that nose from a distance. I'm losing my connection again, so let me see if they can keep up with that one. Here we go. I said they have one, two, three, and occasionally four cabs. Uh, this last uh, spring, I witnessed a mama bear with uh, four cabs, and barely she had her hands full. But the last I saw her was in early December, and the cabs were really growing up, and they're doing real fine. So that's a great testament to the care of the mother bear. But if you come to Williams Wildlife Group, we're going to talk so much about bears, we're pregnant on bears, we have people that come here uh, that have studied bears, and, and people from our national park that are 30, and they're 30 on, on black bears, so we're just going to have a great time doing that. <laughs> Excuse me, another thing we do at Williams Wildlife Group is we share a lot about the past, because our past is rich in these Smoky Mountains. People came here for uh, religious freedom, they came here to establish farms and homesteads, they worked hard, they cleared fields, you go through these mountains and you'll see these beautiful uh, stone fence rail and, and you'll say, oh, gosh, that's nice if they stopped there. Well, yeah, it was nice, but it was a necessity. We had to clear these fields and some of those stone fence rails were actually the, the uh, livestock and some uh, were used to uh, uh, I clear the path and, and make a place for them to uh, grow the crops. But it's so interesting because um, the National History Association and the National Park uh, and friends of the smokers all contribute to maintain and restore and, uh, and sustain the uh, heritage of the smokers so that you and I can see some of the old cabins and barns. So if you come here, you can see how people live before and you can understand them and feel more connected about them. Mountains that we have. Here's another great fox. It's just to tell you that every rock in the Smokies, uh, and especially it seems in the morning, you can see through the trees more, and it's a little easier to uh, uh, identify and, and to uh, spend time because the, the animals are in uh, survival mode, they're out there uh, feeding and hunting. So you get experiences that are removed, never uh, predictable, but, but always a, a wonderful surprise, whether it's a great box or a red box, uh, there's always um, a great balance of nature in these mountains. We get to see uh, a variety of wildlife, a variety of wildlife, and every day is just absolutely wonderful. We get to enjoy the fluctuations in our bird population because as, as far uh, migration takes place, many of our warblers and, and songbirds migrate to um, Central and, and South America and fly thousands of miles to make that circuit and come back to the Great Smoky Mountains in the spring because this is where they nest and they raise the worm. And then we have other species that are resting here to earth all year long and others that come from northern areas and just spend the winter with us. But this is the eastern blue bay, of course, and these are really nice. And you can see those red farmsteads and kids' coves seen in many parts of the Great Smoky Mountains, but mining is a big part. We used to think that the hermit thrush was a, uh, a visitor to the Smokies, but now there's evidence of mud and nest in the high country. So he's one of our favorite birds because he's very friendly. He will be out on the trail and hear a chirp, 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 and look out, and he's going to find a lot in the room, and he's sort of curious about you. This is obviously the robin, but the the illustration we make is that we have an abundance of foods for animals here year round. Some of the animals wait for several um, deep freezes to occur, so some of the bears can become more uh, palatable. They, they don't eat these bears till after they've been frozen a few times. But we're talking about birds, and, and the main thing we're going to talk about is the chair and watching birds. I, I know a lot of you may not be uh, so deeply in it. But you know, when you get outside and walk down the trail, you see things that you haven't seen before. And we find out that it's just such a joy to uh, experience birds. And, and then you find you can see birds no matter where you go. Uh, there's a uh, sort of a, 
something that happens that causes us to to want to know more and want to see more because birds are a big part of our life. So that's something we encourage. Everything about wilderness wildlife work was always intended to be and continues to be about learning. The more you and I know about the outdoors, the more we know about the black bear or the gray fox or, or any species that help or have been reintroduced to live the island that we're from, the more we know about them, the more we equip our chances of seeing them, and the more we appreciate them, uh, and the more we want to come and see them more often. So everything that we do here, whether it's thinking about the people that once live here, the people um, that, you know, that are experts on, on different subjects, everything is about teaching, not learning. Everything is about getting into the mountains and crossing the footbridge. We get to know a lot of folks. And, you know, pause, mate. Yeah. What's it doing, bud? So you want me to hook this one up, Brian? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> the, the, the other thing that we frequently do, maybe this is the one of the most uh, desirable things that people uh, come to Wilderness Wildlife Week to enjoy. And, and that is to, to get out in the mountains. I mean, we love to do these programs in the morning and the evening. And we have activities from uh, 8.30 in the morning, sometimes till 9.30 or 10 at night constantly. And you can pick and choose what you want to be a part of. But during those daylight hours, we also have you out in the park. And we cross those little foot bridges that take us into great areas. And no matter how many times we walk the trail, it's always different around the next bend. So we encourage you to come in and get outside with us. Um, if you can change me. All right. Sometimes we, uh, you know, a snow like today and some of the roads might be closed across the mountain for safety's sake because it's very, uh, can be very icy beneath the snow. But we've, we've learned something at Wilderness Wildlife Week. Uh, weather uh, doesn't uh, prevent us from doing things. It allows us to do things. It's an opportunity, not a barrier. It's an opportunity to, to get out in the mountains at a time when most people prefer to stay inside. It's an opportunity to see. It's an opportunity to be uh, around the wildlife that are, are much more approachable at this time of the year. So we actually look forward to the change in the weather. Uh, right now, if we could go up along the mountains, maybe along the Chimneys Trail to Road Prong uh, and many other places in, in these 2,000 miles of streams, we would see ice forming around the boulders. It makes a, a different landscape than we're used to seeing at other seasons of the year. We can go to very familiar places like uh, this is the area in Greenbrier. Uh, there's a waterfall here. You know, if you were here in, in late spring and through the summer, and you were standing in this exact place, you might look up and there'd be a kayak come around the bend or someone on a, an inner tube, and they'd just be laughing and having a great time navigating the Greenbrier River down through the eastern section of the Smokies. But in the winter, that same familiar place is transformed, and we love to see it in a different way. So that's one of the things we can help you experience when you come to Wilderness Wildlife Week. I don't know anything more peaceful than a walk on a snowy day. If we could leave here just now and go into the Smokies and, and throw on our pack and a few layers of clothing and start out through the mountains and the only sound we'd hear is a little bit of a crunch of our boots in the snow and the birds would chirp and the juncos would cheep and we'd walk along these trails and if you can look really close, you'd see a little the roof of an old cabin in the distance and it would be an experience that you would never forget. So we want to take you there. So come to Wilderness Wildlife next year and, and be a part of that. And we can have an experience where we can literally connect with you and show you things in, in real time as we get into the mountains. When we get out there, we, we, we gain a new respect for the people that settled these mountains before there was a park. The National Park was established in 1934. 
but some of the people that came here to build those rock fence rows and the uh, cabins here were rugged people, good people. Uh, those were hard days, but from everything I can hear, and, and, and I had lots of wonderful older friends who, who once lived in the park, and, and most of those people are gone now, but they told me great stories about great days in the mountains. So even though there were hard days, there were happy days. People were very content to live here. You know, when you look across this footbridge, it crosses one of the, the thousands of streams in the park. You th I think about the times I've crossed with different people and we've all laughed looking down at the stream or holding onto the guardrail or whatever it might be. But we knew that on the other side of that bridge, there was more to see, there were more wonders. And those footbridge friendships, we'll call them this morning, forge great friendships. So we hope you'll come. We'd like to get to know you more. And, and it's nothing like bonding and experience than being out in the mountains together. We have many off-trail experiences. We don't want you to share those unless you know, go with someone who really knows the mountains. You can get so turned around and you would think in 600,000 acres, you could just, people have the old uh, idea that, well, I'll just find a stream and walk it out. Well, you can be prepared to walk for miles through some of the most rugged territory you ever thought about. So we don't even begin to encourage hiking off trail unless you're with someone who knows uh, the area. But with 800 plus miles of trails, plus about 70 something miles of the Appalachian Trail through the Smokies, there's plenty of places to hike. But when you hike those trails and you look off trail, we also have to stop and realize that there's a, there's a world out there beyond all the wonders that we see on the trails. So it's just a big, beautiful, wonderful place that we want you to experience. This morning, this would be the scene. Anywhere we walked 360 degrees once we got into the mountains, we could turn and look, and this would be the, the landscape. I see snow covered, and yet tolerable. It's, it's just, it's 30 degrees. That's pleasant walking. That's good walking, we call it. And we hope you'll come here to enjoy this. We also realize that you may not be able to make it in the winter, so we emphasize the wonders of other seasons when you come here. So we'll talk to you about some of the uh, wonderful waterfalls. I think that's one of the favorite things of many people who come to the Smokies and, and, and many of the hikers that come here to, uh, to see new areas and get in the back country. Uh, they always ask, uh, where's a good waterfall I can walk? So we'll show you a lot of good waterfalls and talk to you about uh, the, the aquatic life. We have some amazing things. We have uh, reptiles and amphibians. We have uh, salamanders here that are endemic, means they're found here and nowhere else in the world. Studies have been um, recently conducted that have revealed uh, thousands of new organisms in these mountains, and, and there's just fun things to see, uh, from the big uh, river otters that play along the streams to our, uh, our trout in the high country, the brook trout, uh, just, just a, a world of beauty out there. We learn in that process of being out in the mountains, just to, how to soak it in. You know, I, I, I stand sometimes on top of the mountain and be three or four other people come there and I, I know it's maybe their first trip to the mountains and they, they jump out of the car and they walk out of there. And sometimes I just hear them just take a deep breath and go, how wonderful, how, how beautiful. And, that, and that's what you can expect to experience when you come to the Smokies, any season, any day, whether it's rain or sunshine, it's always beautiful here. So we want you to breathe and, and enjoy. Uh, we can guarantee you that there's a surprise on every walk. Uh, it, it may be something that you've never seen. It may be something you haven't seen in years. It may, may just be something that, that you heard about and you always wanted to see. This is our rough grouse. Uh, when I was a little fella, I didn't always understand that thump, 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 thump that I would hear when I went out in the mountains until I saw a grouse drumming. They have special logs that they choose to jump up on in their mating season and they, they drum and they spread their tail feathers as you can see here. It's a rare uh, bird for the Smokies, but it's a, a wonderful bird to see. And that's just one of the many uh, experiences that you can expect to have when you come to the Smokies. I, I mention our personal contribution because once you come here and you participate in Wilderness Week, then you have a knowledge, you have experiences that you can take home. You, you have an understanding 
and not just an understanding, but an appreciation of our natural world that we uh, emphasize. And you can go back home and, and you can share with people uh, what, what they might come and see or what they might see in their own backyard. But you, you become a, a, a spokesman for the, for the good things about this world. We, we have lots of, lots of bad news that seems to be contagious sometimes, but you know, there's so much good news to share. And if you come to the Smokies at Wilderness Week, you won't hear anything but good things at this place because we talk about the things that, that are, are enriching for our life, the things that, that encourage us and build us up. And we want you to come and be a part of that. You know, I keep a journal. A journal is a, a great little thing. You say, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, you might because if you ever start doing that, you can't stop. Uh, our memory is, uh, is somewhat limited. You may not remember the day that you were hiking through the mountains and just off the trail, there were 60 pink lady slippers, which are, are a gorgeous wildflower. We have over 1,500 species of flowering plants here in the Smokies, and they start blooming from late February all the way into November when the witch hazel blooms out. But I keep that journal as a sort of a calendar of life, I call it, because when I write down what I saw that day, when I'm out for a walk or I'm out on a drive or, or I experience a sunrise or sunset, I know to go back to that area and it will improve my chances of seeing something wondrous and spectacular uh, the next year and the next year. Or how to, I can look through my journal and someone asks me, well, where would I go today to see this or that? And I said, well, last year I was there in this incredible waterfall and, and a bear walked up on the waterfall and I saw these these uh, just uh, a lot of fish that were hatched out and, and I'm sure the river otters are coming in, but it was a spectacular day. And I have this written down. That was yesterday, a year ago. So a journal can be a wonderful thing. We, we learn the habits of wildlife when you come to Wilderness Week, Wildlife Week. We, we learn where to find them because that's what you want to do. Sometimes I think we want to jump up in the middle of the program and say, all right, I just want to go there. But we learn so much about the animals and, and how they, how they thrive. Many animals we, we think survive, but most of the animals here in the Smokies, even though we have that balance of nature, but most of our wildlife subjects and species um, thrive in these mountains. We learn to see more than you can see. In other words, when we stand and, and look at a site, uh, you can see the backside of the chimneys in the top left of the photograph. You can look down through that Sugarland Valley that's uh, so rich with wildlife and tumbling streams that go down the mountains. But you know, when you look at those mountains with deeper understanding, you see more than you can see. You know that there are bears out there and, and that's nothing to be feared. It's something to be excited about, but it's something to enjoy, but not to be feared. But there are so many species of wildlife out there. You look across the mountains and you think of all the, uh, the trees. We talked about that vapor that turns into a fog and rises up through the valleys and causes these great smoky mountains to uh, illustrate their name. It's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. I talked about that calendar of life. In our hearts and minds and our journals, we develop what, what's known as a phonology. A phonology is a study of everything that happens through the year on specific days, whether it's the the hatch of a certain fly in the mountains that the, the trout are, are fond of when they light on the stream, whether it's the time when the, uh, the warblers come into the mountains and, and that's staggered through the mountains. Uh, Dr. Fred also wrote a wonderful book, Birds of the Smokies, and it tells you what time of the year those birds come in and, and where they're generally seen and found. But you can develop your own phonology through the years of all the things that happen. And we encourage you and we try to illustrate how to do that when you come to Wilderness Wildlife Week. You know, we find, find beauty in the storm. No matter whether it's a snowstorm at Wilderness Wildlife Week or a rainstorm, because our, our fronts move through the Smokies and sometimes rather quickly. So um, it is an illustration of uh, if this is not your favorite weather, just wait a few minutes because we have... Uh, uh, we have rains that come through and, and we can follow those down the mountains that run from east to west. And, and as you get out to the end of the slope on the Foothills Parkway in Cosby, we can stand there and wait for that shower to come through and pass. And when the sun hits those showers, it, it gives us our rainbow that's, 
that's exceptionally beautiful. The mountains are constantly being reshaped. This is a stream in Cosby that I walk often, but, but those large house-sized boulders have been moved there by flash floods and changing floods. Those changes occur constantly. We talked about the fires that change the mountains. Well, we have flash floods here. Uh, we experience droughts. Uh, we have so many things, natural factors, that continually reshape the mountains. There are places where there have been landslides, where I used to hike, and, and, and I even hike now, but the whole side of the mountain has, has slipped down and even taken out parts of the road in two or three places in Smokies just over the last 15 or 20 years. But some changes have occurred in the last uh, year or, or, or two years. We're constantly changing these mountains. You can see these boulders. It's hard to get a perspective, but that large boulder on top was moved there uh, just a few years ago. There used to be a bridge that crossed out of Greenbrier into a place that we hike called Ramsey Cascades. But these, a large flood came back there years ago, and, and it actually took the bridge out, which was a steel bridge, and twisted that bridge. And the bridge is not, has been replaced now by a foot bridge. But these house-sized boulders were moved. And now they're being sculpted and shaped and broken apart in the winter by the ice and, and smoothed down by the constant flow of the stream. So there's this constant sculpting process in all of our streams. I talked about the massive outbursts. If you come to the Smokies in, in, in May, you're going to start to experience the mountain laurel, which is only one of the, the great blooms of the mountains. We have, uh, as I said, 1,500 species of, of flowering plants, but the mountain laurel as, a, as an unusual, but uh, mountain folks that, uh, and I grew up with, with, with this terminology, they call this ivy, but we call it mountain laurel. But we have rhododendron and they call that laurel. So we're not here to confuse you, but there's a parallel of terms uh, that you'll enjoy in the smoke. As a matter of fact, if you're listening to me, we have our own language. We, uh, you, you may have been writing down some things like, what did he say? Well, that's, that's just part of it, living in these mountains. We just sort of casual about things, and uh, when we say things, it may not be the exact way you pronounce those things, but we're, we're on the same page as far as what we mean and what we want to share with you. So just smile a little bit and ask us what you say a few times, and we'll always make it clear for you. Another massive bloom that we have, and this summer was incredible. These are flame azalea blooms, and on our bald areas that are grassy areas that are somewhat unexplained, um, we see uh, flame azalea in, in a variety of colors, but mostly the, the bright flaming orange that gives the azalea its name. So that's a, a, a beautiful outburst of color in the mountains that, that occurs. These mountains are so diverse that there are still pockets of virgin forest. The tree in the background, this is an all bright nature grove, would take seven of us hand to hand to reach around this tree. It's an old poplar. That, uh, that, that was not logged out or, or taken from the mountains. And you can see some of the remnants of trees that are falling there, but we still have uh, large pockets of, of virgin forest that you can enjoy. And we hiked some of those at Wilderness Week. We have a spruce fir forest that just, just smells good. It, it's just rich with all the aroma of the, of the spruce and, and the Fraser fir and, and, and the hemlocks that bloom nearby. And, and all the plants, the mosses, and the ferns on the ground. You can walk through there and you just you just feel like you've stepped into another area. Some of our, our forests are temperate rainforests, meaning they get over 85 inches of rain during the year, so they qualify as a rainforest. And these are areas where you find some of our, our reptiles and, and amphibians even along the stream, but certainly in the, in the rainforest, and it's a wonderful place to be. And where would we be if we didn't talk about fall? This it seems to be uh, a favorite for many people, even though there's not a bad day in the Smokies. And I can say that having lived a lifetime in the foothills of these mountains and hiked in these mountains, there's not a bad day in the mountains. Autumn splendor is incredible. You see that large fog bank. Well, there's a lake out there called Fontana. And many days on a cold day in the high country, we look out at the fall colors and that cloud bank, that ocean of clouds is hovering over the lake. So it's always, always a beauty to see. Um, people ask when the peak of the colors would be. Well, everyone's always sort of gauged things around the third week of October, but I can tell you from the first week of October till near Thanksgiving, 
we have beautiful pockets of color in the Smokies. I've never experienced a bad year. People say, well, there just wasn't that sweeping color. I said, well, it just wasn't sweeping where you were because I can tell you always that I have never failed in, in my life of exploring these mountains to find beauty. And there's such a diversity of, of trees here. So with all the species of trees and all this variety of colors, <clears throat> you can always experience something more than wonderful. And speaking of wonderful, when we're on top of the mountains late in the evening and we're enjoying the color, you just never know how the sun's going to just uh, explode to the clouds. And, and these uh, layers of light uh, just seem to sweep across the mountains. That's, again, Mount LeConte in the background and so many identifiable uh, peaks and, and ridges uh, that go up. Uh, there's a little ridge there called the Sawtooth Range. Many years ago that uh, we had a, a sweeping uh, a forest fire in pre-park days. And that same spring, we had uh, massive uh, rains and, and a couple of cloud bursts, and it scoured that mountain and even an area we call Charlie's Bunyan, and the vegetation was swept off, and it, it has never completely regrown, and it leaves these outcroppings of stone that are quite beautiful, and that sawtooth range uh, is, is indicative of that uh, natural process. But if I had described these mountains in two words, we look and people talk about these being old mountains, and they certainly are. They talk about the Smokies not being as pronounced as the Rockies, and they're not. But let me tell you something. Walking through these mountains, these are rugged mountains. They're gentle in their appeal, but they're rugged in their experience. And there's rarely uh, uh, anything that, that I could imagine that I couldn't experience here from, from sheer cliffs where the peregrine falcon is being reintroduced and, and, and has finally nested here after 50 year absence uh, to, to places where there have been sightings of, of mountain lions, which are, were once uh, native here, but now questionable whether there's a remnant, but certainly those areas occur. We have places called the cat stairs by the old folks and, and those cat stairs were named for that for a reason. Uh, but these mountains are, are, are rugged, but they're beautiful. Uh, and, and as I say, they're gentle and they're peeled. Nothing better than a spring day just to take your shoes off and set on a big boulder and put your feet in that water and let your cares go on down the stream. So we invite you to come to Wilderness Week anytime you can. We're going to share with you all year long, but certainly at Wilderness Wildlife Week, we're going to really try to pour our hearts out. Uh, no one... Uh, is compensated for coming here to share things. Nothing, there's no charge for you to participate in Wilderness Wildlife Week. It's just a time where we all come together. And, and like scripture says, it's like one beggar telling another beggar where he found a piece of bread. We just talk about good things uh, with good people. And we all leave here realizing that we're better for having experienced another year of Wilderness Wildlife Week. Now, I want to take some time, if you have a question, to try to answer those questions, because I'm so excited that there's hundreds of you out there that, that have tuned in this morning. Uh, maybe you saw something you haven't seen. Maybe you saw something you'd love to see, but I hope everyone's excited about coming back here to Wilderness Wildlife Week. So if you have a question, I'm going to rely on technology to forward that question. And then I'm going to try to answer that to the best of my ability. And if I can, I'll refer you to someone who can. Well, the, the volcano is, is un, unnamed. Uh, it lies uh, beneath the surface. Four miles beneath the surface, there was a, a, an earthquake in, in the Smokies just a, a year or so ago, a 3.1 magnitude, uh, just a, a mile east of Mount LeConte. Mount LeConte's one of our, our high peaks in the Smokies. There's a little lodge up there that's built out of log. You can go stay there. But that volcano lies miles beneath the surface of uh, Mount Leconte. So if, if it had a name, you know, the Cherokee, it's interesting, the Cherokee people, 
who are, are dear friends of ours and, and who participate in Wilderness Wildlife Week and share a lot of knowledge and have with me and been my friends for years. It's interesting that years and years and years ago, they call Mount LeConte Giant Mountain of Fire. Now, we don't know how to connect that scientifically, but we know that they live so close to the land that they understood things that we overlook. So Mount Lacan is the area where the dormant volcano was, was determined to be. But as the researchers said, it's dormant and it rests. Now, who knows, 300 years, 500 years. We do know who knows, but we don't know. So that's where the volcano is, Mount Lacan. Thanks for that question. That's a good question. A good resource for uh, for hiking trails. There, there's actually several. Uh, we we have a group called the Great Smoky Mountain Association. It used to be called the Great Smoky Mountains Natural History Association, but they publish uh, several really great guides. One little uh, brochure is called Day Hikes in the Smokies for people that want to take short hikes and. And they emphasize some of the more popular, but some of the more uh, scenic uh, trails to hike in the Smokies. Uh, there's there's a, a, a little blue thick book that comes with a map that's a wonderful guide to the Smokies. Um, the uh, I think that one of the authors is Merlis, but it's it's called Guide to Hiking in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. That's pretty straightforward. You won't forget that. But if you look that up, uh, that's a great guide and, and, and make sure and get the one that has the map included in the back. Even though you can get a, a waterproof or a paper map uh, at any of the visitor centers in the Smokies in their trail maps. It, they even show you the overnight uh, campsites if you decide to spend more than just a day out hiking. So those are two books that are, that are really good. There's a number of books out there, but these two are standards that have been used for uh, many, many years, and they are constantly being updated. So I think you'll enjoy either of those. Someone said, <clears throat> if, you encounter, if you encounter a black bear, and we only have black bears here to put you at rest, but um, what do you do if you encounter that bear? Well, First of all, you want to let that bear know what you are. So you just sort of put your hands up in the air and look as large as you can and go, hey bear, hey bear. And that bear is going to recognize the fact that you're not another bear and you're not a threat to that bear. So probably you're going to see the backside of that bear as he goes off into the road to dinner and down the trail. If he keeps coming forward, he's looking for a place to get off the trail that you're on. So just not that he's going to come all the way to you, but 99.9 .9 times out of 100, he's just looking for a, a safe passage to, to go off the trail. Now, if it's a bear with cubs, you just, hey, bear, hey, bear, and, and take a few steps and get, give her some room. She's, she's got a big task ahead to take care of those cubs, so she's going to try to find a safe place so her cubs can follow you or follow her off the trail. So you're going to be safe. If there's a bear in the Smokies that you need to be concerned about, it's a bear in a picnic area that someone has uh, done a, a, a great disservice to. Someone has fed that bear. And, and once you feed a bear, sometimes that bear departs from his natural foods and he starts to look at picnics as being something that he can take advantage of to, to get people food, which are not only harmful to the bear uh, and his, as a health hazard, but also harmful to the bear as he departs from his natural foods and starts to hang out in those picnic areas. And lots of times that bear has to be removed. And sad to say, when we feed bears, sometimes that bear becomes a hazard in the sense of getting too close to people and, and he has to be moved away or, or even destroyed. So we don't want that to happen. I, I love bears and, and I've camped out there and with the bears and hiked with the bears. I've never 
had an episode where I felt threatened in all my years being out in these mountains, and you won't either. So when you see the bear, you just say, not, hey, Yogi, because there's no such thing as Yogi. Not, hey, I'm Grizzly Adams, because there's no Grizzly Adams. You just say, hey, bear, hey, bear, and he gets it. He said, I, oh, I see. You're, you're not a bear. You're just a visitor here, and this is my home, so I'm going to move out of the way and let you enjoy it. And that's what he does. The fault line is located uh, most uh, obviously in a place we call White Oak Sinks. Uh, th there are, are caves there. Part of that area uh, is closed because it's such a fragile area and uh, you certainly don't want people to do uh, any serious uh, spelunking in that area because those caves are sort of vertical and dangerous. Uh, but that's where a big part of the study was and that's where this thrust fault. You might want to study that and look that up to understand what a thrust fault is. But that's that's where that uh, research was done and that's where the obvious uh, indications are that the fault uh, not only exists, but it's, it's very obvious in that area. You can see uh, areas in the rock where, uh, in a rock wall where the, the rock looks like it has melted, but it has shifted. And, and, and it looks like it's just not diagonally, but it's just terraced in the way that it falls down on the landscape. And that's when the land has shifted because of this thrust fall. That's a, another good question. These are all good questions. Thanks for asking. How can we teach others to honor and maintain natural environments? I tell you, one of the best places to start, sign up for Wilderness Wildlife Week. You know, if you come, the more you know about an area, we, I said this earlier, but let me emphasize this again. I don't know of any other place. It's one of the reasons that Wilderness Wildlife Week has won uh, international awards. I mean, prestigious awards. But I don't know of another area where at no charge, you can come for a few days and be like a sponge and soak in information from world authorities on specific subjects in, in reference to our natural world and, and take those take that information back with you. And, and just like this morning, we're going to rebroadcast this for, for weeks. If you want to go back on mypigeonforwards.com slash wilderness, you can see this again. But the more you know, I, I emphasize reading for sure. Read books. There's great, great reference books. Uh, I'm constantly available to folks that ask questions and, and want to answer anything that you have and, and certainly share references for books. But, uh, but plug into uh, to, to nature clubs and, and, and get to know the birds in your area and, and learn more about the wildlife so that you can share that with people because uh, it, it's a chain reaction. The, the more we know, the more we share, the, the more we share, we, we, we see the enthusiasm in other people and it becomes a chain reaction and we just become more connected over good things. And, and it's healthy for our mind in every way. It's healthy, uh, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. These mountains are just good for you. So uh, connect with us and we'll help you all we can. And then connect with any natural resource around you so that you can uh, understand and volunteer and plug into their, uh, their volunteer efforts there too. Well, the the question is, thanks, Pam. Good to good to hear from you this morning. I'd like, like to say good to see you, but we'll we'll do that next year. Hopefully, you'll be here. But uh, where do we photograph sunrises and sunsets in the Smokies? Well, obviously, uh, with the mountains running east and west, uh, it, it's it's not that's not as easy as you would think. Uh, sunrise in the summertime uh, is a major event uh, in the uh, Clemens Dome parking lot major event. People can be lined up way before daylight. It's also good at a place we call Lufty Overlook, a kind of Lufty Overlook, which just passes the Cleveland's Dome Road. It's the first pull out to the right as you start down the mountain, just past Cleveland's Dome Road, going toward Cherokee, and pull up there, and you'll, you'll have company as well. That's a great sunrise place. 
but there are other places uh, on, on Balsam Mountain Road. Once you go up the Blue Ridge Parkway and, and turn left on Balsam Mountain Road, come back into the, uh, the Smokies, you'll see the sign. Uh, you're, you're driving above Cherokee and looking out over layers of mountains. That's a great, great spot. Sunset is also good uh, from, from Clingman's Dome. <coughs> it varies, obviously, according to the season and, and the weeks of the year, but uh, it, it's, it's a good place. One place to see the Smokies in a spectacular view uh, is, is to drive Interstate 40 uh, to the, uh, uh, we're going to, I'm taking you to Max Patch. You may know that area, Pam, or others may know that area. Uh, but the, the exit is called Harmon's Den. And, and when you cross the North Carolina line on I-40, uh, you're looking for a, an exit uh, that says Harmon Den. If you look for, for Waterville exit and then Hartford exit, and then you keep your eye peeled for Harmon Den, uh, you, you take a right and then a left on a gravel road. that takes about 20 minutes to take you to the top of the mountains where the Appalachian Trail crosses. And you look back, and then there's an unending view of uh, of the Smokies, layer upon layer upon layer. That's probably the most spectacular sunset place. It's also a heavily used place, a place that we're sort of uh, crying out for uh, folks to be uh, sensitive to that environment up there, because folks are are camping there and and uh, not being really good stewards of the land. So if you go up there, just enjoy that. If you see uh, garbage bring it back with you but uh, anyway that that's a real good place thanks pam for asking those questions i'll uh, i'll help further if i can it's kenjenkins.com if i can ever answer a question for you what is your most memorable moment in nature wow someone asked what's my most memorable moment in nature boy i have so many uh, wonderful experiences as you do if you spend time in the outdoors. Um, I can, I, most of my most memorable moments could never be planned and weren't, weren't expected. Uh, there have been times in my life, like in your life, where I've experienced uh, uh, things that uh, required a lot of my thought, a lot of my attention. And, uh, and I need to just think about it. Need to just go to the mountains, John Muir said, and get the good tidings. Just need to go up to the mountains and and just be still and and be quiet and, and just realize that uh, you know God's taking care of me and I just need to listen. And I've sat on top of these mountains and, and like the photograph that we're looking at with all those rays coming through the clouds, I've just sort of been refreshed and restored by the beauty that I see, realizing no man could improve on that. Nobody made that. Uh, we can only just uh, enjoy and, and appreciate and, uh, and be a part of it. So those, those moments uh, where I just intentionally went to, to be still have become the most cherished moments in my life. And, and I think they would be that for you, whether you go up to sit on a stream and, and read a book and think, or whether you go to the top of the mountain and wait for the sunset. Sometimes you know, it'll be rainy and we'll go to the top of the mountain and that can be the most glorious time. You can, as the storm was moving out in this last photograph that I shared, uh, the, the rays started dancing through the clouds like I haven't seen before or since. So there's always something special waiting for us, uh, but you won't know if you don't go. So uh, I think those are some of those special times. What type of salamanders live in Tennessee and how do we get snowy apples? Yeah, what type of salamanders live in Tennessee, and do we get snowy owls? Well, good questions. There's there's a lot of salamanders. The red-cheeked salamander is uh, found here and nowhere else in the world. So we got lots of salamanders, and there's books. I can't just uh, uh, I couldn't just give you all the names of the salamanders, but but they're one of the fascinating things about. Uh, uh, discovering the Smokies, and, and there are so many people that come to Willers Week that are very knowledgeable about those and, and can tell you where to look and, and actually take you and show you uh, what you'd like to see. Now, as far as snowy owls, you've asked at a, a really unique time uh, in the world. Snowy owls have pushed further south this year 
than at any other time in my life. So people are seeing snowy owls in, in Kentucky. There, there was a snowy owl uh, in, in, in Virginia, but generally I go north to see the snowy owl. I mean, they're in, in New York and in Maine, Vermont, uh, along the coast, uh, you, you're seeing uh, snowy owls. I see snowy owls in, in, in Minnesota in, in the deep of the winter because they come down from Canada. But this is not habitat for the snowy owl. And if there's a snowy owl spotted in the Smokies, everybody on, on bird alert in the uh, 150 miles is going to drive to the Smokies just on the outside chance they'll see a snowy owl. But we have screech owls. We have sawwet owls. We have barred owls, even a few barn owls. And then we have great horned owls. So there's no shortage of owls here, but the snowy owl is sort of a, a uh, extreme rarity to be seen in this area. We're going to have to end, folks, and we appreciate it. Come to Wilderness Week and stay tuned in. We appreciate it.